Hi, welcome to our session called Contract as Code as Contract, Rust to Unify Specification and Implementation. I'm Adam Leventhal calling in from Smoky, San Francisco, and I'm an engineer at the Oxide Computer Company. Hi, I'm Dave Pacheco. I'm also an engineer at the Oxide Computer Company calling in from not quite so smoky Albany, California. All right, so we're gonna be talking about contract as code as contract and to explain a bit about uh, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to cover why we embraced Open API, uh, which I'm sure is uncontroversial for folks coming to this conference, uh, designing an API workflow that worked for us and our product and our team, and then how we built and why we built an API server in Rust. So you can think of this a little bit like half experience report and half love note uh, to Rust, the language. So to give a little context first, I wanna talk about what we're building at the Oxide Computer Company. Uh, what we're building is a computer, but not like this and not like this and not even like this, although this one is pretty cool. Uh, we're building a, a server. So a computer designed for a data center. And so it's sort of like this or like this, but uh, actually these are surprisingly a lot like this, uh, which is a pretty good deal for a cheap computer. Um, and if you go to like the 23andMe, the genetic code for these kinds of computers, these kinds of servers, what you actually get is a lot of this uh, original DNA from the original PC. It's a lot like that, that Dell from Walmart and a lot like this IBM PC. And in fact, when you boot these things, it's like you're replaying the last 35 years of personal computing history. So what we really want is a computer designed for the data center, a rack scale computer like the ones you might see in data centers at Amazon or at Google or at Facebook. And so notably, Facebook has shared some of these designs, but there's still all of the software that makes these kinds of rack scale, these kinds of cloud computers go. So what we're building at, at Oxide is a computer that runs on premises, runs within your own data center, that's rack scale, and it's got all or some of that functionality of the public cloud. It's fully integrated software and hardware. And here, really critically, it's driven by APIs, uh, APIs for all these different cloud services like VMs and disks and networking and all that stuff. Um, and it's got this operator interface with CLI, uh, APIs, docs, all that. So a lot of that important pieces is in the software, not just in the hardware. So because so much of that value comes from the software, because that, that's so critical, even before we started building the hardware and designing the hardware, we started designing an API. Um, and there we started in the cheapest way possible, which was in a text file. Uh, we picked Open API early, this emerging standard for uh, API specification. Lots and lots of folks are using it. Lots of folks here, I'm sure, are using it. Um, and we started writing a bunch of YAML to figure out what that API wanted to look like. And we started sharing that with our prospective customers and with advisors to get feedback early on how that API was gonna function for folks. And if you look around for how uh, experts like folks writing sites like API Evangelist or APIs you won't hate, uh, Ken and Phil, they'll, they'll tell you we're doing it right so far that we're starting to flesh out that specification. And what they'll say is next is that that spec should grow into the contract by which the, the API abides. And that's totally right some of the time. You know, for us, we really wanted to view that, that YAML file, that, that API spec, the way that a graphic designer or a user experience designer might regard a sketch or a wireframe. Uh, we learned a lot iterating in YAML, but that was not the contract. And so why are we special? Well, for this particular product, in this particular project, there's a ton of interconnected pieces. It's highly technical. There's a lot just that we didn't know. And we knew that implementation, writing the code, was gonna be a really important guide to tell us what we were building, kind of revealing that sculpture as we removed the excess marble. Um, so, and we've got pieces all over the stack, you know, from, I'm from like low level systems and board design and uh, hypervisors all the way up to API servers and uh, user interfaces. So we're really as full stack as you can get and we needed a workflow that fit with this team and this product. 
what we wanted was the code to be that contract. Um, we wanted open API, as we said before, it's, it's great like for generating client code or for generating CLIs or docs or lots of other kinds of tool-based internal uses. Um, we wanted it to be built in Rust. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. And because we're not monsters, because we, we know that lots of other folks have in, innovated in important ways, we started looking for a library that was gonna meet our needs. So we looked at Actix and we looked at Rocket, both Rust libraries um, for building web interfaces. But really open API support was not as, as primary as we wanted it to be. So drawing inspiration from things like uh, Drop Wizard and Restify and Java and, and JavaScript respectively, we started building our own uh, library for, for building APIs um, that had open API really tightly integrated into that. We want the code to act as the contract using type information in Rust for almost everything and then annotations for stuff that was really specific to open API. So why Rust? Um, Rust is designed for concurrency, for safety, for, for rigorous structure. Um, we are building here something, not a service that we're running in the cloud, for example, something that we could lay hands on easily, but rather something that's gonna live in our customers' data centers on premises where we don't really have ready access to it. So we needed something that was just gonna set it and forget it, where we didn't wanna bump into pathologies like garbage collection or um, you know, consumption of resources. When our customers buy these rack scale computers that are full of CPU and memory and disk, they wanna really use it for their workloads, not for our workloads. So we needed something uh, that was gonna generate really robust lean binaries and, and Rust does that. Also, just as a team, we're using Rust everywhere. So yes, in the API server, as we're discussing, but also in that back end of the control plane, a bunch of hardware services, our hypervisor, our host, parts of our host OS, areas of firmware and embedded operating system. So although we've got lots of different kinds of projects all over the stack, Rust is a unifying theme within Oxide. So we wanted, uh, code to be as the complete contract. We didn't want to have to hunt and peck around for other information. We want to use and abuse, and we'll talk about that in a second, the, the Rust type system. Um, developers didn't want to, don't want to have to remember that there's some documentation file somewhere else. Code reviewers don't want to have to check ancillary information. We want everything sitting right there uh, and, and apply just the right amount of magic for this vertically integrated team where Folks don't necessarily want to become API experts and we want the easy thing, the obvious thing to be the right thing for folks who are not focused on that part of the stack. So I mentioned abusing the type system. I want to just give a very quick aside on one of the things we love most about Rust, which is Rust macros. So Rust macros are unlike anything that I've seen in languages. They're incredibly flexible. And in particular, you just get a sequence of tokens in and you dump a sequence of tokens out and you can generate whatever you code you want during that compilation phase. So it, it takes uh, the place of lots of runtime introspection, stuff that you would see like reflection and uh, can be much more efficient therefore. And it also generates errors therefore at compile time rather than at runtime, which is also something really important to us, as we said, in a system that we're shipping rather than operating. So here's a quick example. Uh, common, very, very common package in Rust that you'll see all over the place, something called CERTI uh, for serialization and deserialization. Um, all you have to do is take your struct, say derive CERTI deserialize, and then all of a sudden you can take your JSON string, for example, and have CERTI dump that into your structured file. That uses uh, code that happens at compile time rather than at runtime. Same thing with like JSON schema. You can just tag your structure and say, I wanna be able to generate JSON schema from it. And you can do that very efficiently. Here's an example of the code that the Rust compiler will dump out. And you can see in various places that you've got types for each of the members of a particular structure as it generates it. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dave to talk about what we wanted to build in our uh, Rust API framework. Thanks, Adam. So yeah, we, we ended up building a library called Dropshot for building 
um, HTTP APIs in Rust programs with open API is first class. And the question is, what do we want that to look like? And here's kind of an idealized example of that. So um, the first thing is that each API endpoint or open API operation is a single Rust function. And that may seem obvious, but there are other ways to do it as well. We wanted to do that to have a single place to put documentation and examples and things like that. Um, with each function, you've got the, what you think of as the logical inputs to the API endpoint. So query parameters, path parameters, uh, ways to access the body and headers and things like that. We want those to be function arguments naturally, right? And then whatever the thing actually returns becomes part of this result type. Now result here, like the actual name result is a Rust type that's used widely for anything that can succeed or fail. And it has one type for the thing it returns on success and one type for the thing on failure. And here the type information that goes in there will allow us to determine the specific schema for the response as well as any other information we want, like the status code and headers and things like that. We'll see an example in a second that will hopefully make this clearer. Then we have our endpoint macro where we can put metadata that can't be expressed through the type system because you don't actually need it for the function itself, like the HTTP method, the path where it's gonna show up in the API, any tags and examples and things like that. And then um, did we pull out the rust.common as well. So like other um, modern languages, the dot, there are dot comments that can be pulled out programmatically and even at compile time. So we go ahead and use that documentation that you put on that function as the API documentation so that it's all in one place. And then of course you have the code that does the work, but we're not gonna be talking about that today, right? So um, this is what an example endpoint would look like that's a little bit more fleshed out. We've got this get of slash pet slash pet ID with an open API tag of pet. Um, this is the canonical pet store example for open API. Uh, we've got the open API description that comes from the Rust doc comment. Uh, this request context is something that we provide to all endpoints as just a way to get at whatever other APIs that we need to provide, Rust APIs we wanna provide here. The parameters for this particular endpoint are really just one path param, which is this pet ID. So the, the string path here on the left of the angle brackets means that this, whatever's here is coming from the URL path and what, what actually do we expect here? Well, it's this path param struct, which has a pet ID, which is an int 64. And so we can tell again, at compile time, exactly what the types of all these things are, what all the arguments are and what their types are. And then the response type here is this HTTP response okay, which is parameterized by pet. And that basically says, I respond on success with an HTTP status code of 200 and the body is gonna look like this pet object. And we'll show what the open API schema looks like for that. So here's what the open API schema looks like for that thing that we were just looking at. So the, the function I was just describing is at the top left here. We also have the struct pet at the bottom left here. And on the right, we have the open API schema that gets generated for that, excuse me, the open API spec. So uh, of course we have the get method shows up there. We've got the path that shows up at that point in the, in the schema. So this is a get of slash pet slash pet ID. The tags are there as well. The description is pulled from the Rust doc comment, as we said. The path parameters show up here, and this is where some of the more interesting stuff happens. So um, again, that path params struct was defined on the previous slide, just had the one pet ID thing, pet ID field, which is an int 64, um, and that gets translated directly here. Uh, and then the response is a 200 response with a description that we've documented with this HTTP response okay class that just says successful operation. And uh, the content is a pet, which is a JSON schema that is derived from this struct pet at the bottom. So importantly, um, from the consumer here, the person that's using Dropshot, they've defined this function at the top left and they've defined the struct at the bottom left. They haven't defined any serialization or deserialization code or anything that describes the JSON schema for that. That all happens automatically by virtue of these derived macros uh, that are here. Yeah, just an aside, Dave, that's everything, right? Like, so if you're writing the code, it's all in one place. And if I'm reviewing some code, it's all in one place. And uh, if I change the documentation for it, that's all there. I don't have to remember and go find something in some other file um, without uh, otherwise providing uh, a, an incorrect documentation to a prospective user. 
That's right. And, and another important part of it is that if any of it is wrong, it basically won't work. And it usually won't work at compile time. So if you try to return something that's not a pet, that's not going to compile. If you try to return a response code of 201 because you created a pet somehow, that's also not going to compile. So what does it look like to iterate on this thing? We, we mentioned that an important part of this workflow is learning about the API we want to build from the implementation. And suppose we decide as part of implementing this and playing with it that we need a new query parameter for this endpoint and it's going to be something that filters only for dogs. And so you just add a, an argument to the function for this query params. This query bit that is again left of the angle bracket there means that whatever follows this is coming from the query string associated with the request. And the thing within the angle brackets, that query params is defined by the consumer here, and it's there on the bottom left, that query params struct. In this case, it only has one field in it, which is this dogs only bool. And again, by virtue of these derived macros, you get implementations of JSON schema for this thing and deserialize for this thing. And that allows us to automatically generate the JSON schema for it. So the only thing you do is you add this query params argument to the function, you use that in the body of the function, and then the the open API spec will have that in it exactly as described here. Oops. Yeah. So this is what I was just describing. The, the query bit is how we figure out where it comes from. And then the name and the types come from the actual structure. So I guess the, the most, the, the guiding principle for drop shot is that we need it to provide a mechanism for expressing anything that we need as part of any of our APIs. But it doesn't need to be super general purpose. It only really needs to expose one. And it doesn't need to um, make it impossible to do something else. It just makes, needs to make it easy to do the right thing. And by the right thing, we don't just mean something which is what the client expects, but also is consistent with other parts of the API, is going to be scalable, things like that. Um, so for example, the, the HTTP response types we showed on the previous slides are an example of this, where you can construct your own response by hand if you want to, where you control absolutely everything about it. But we've provided a bunch of types that will cause your response to your responses to look the same across all of your APIs because they have all the same headers, use the same status codes for the same types of results and things like that. And another big area where this came up is pagination. I assume people here are pretty familiar with pagination already. It's basically the idea that um, for lots of reasons, you don't want to allow clients to ask the server to do an un unbounded amount of work or an arbitrary large amount of work. This is really important for scalability, availability, security, operability. Um, so what you do is you say, when I have a large collection of things that a client might need to be able to iterate, they can only do so in pages of a fixed size. And so typically they, they make an initial request with parameters that say, maybe filter parameters and maybe ordering parameters. And then they make subsequent requests with some metadata that says where they are in the scan. There's a lot of different ways to do this. You know, classically, there's limit offset, there's key set pagination. You can have a page token. You can have server side state that, that is referenced by that page token or something like that. Um, these have different implications for the client's ease of use and for scalability as well. And, and also for reliability, things like limit offset don't work at all when the underlying collection is changing underneath you. So um, we wanted to provide a way to do this that was where consumers can say, here's the thing that's specific about my API, namely the type of thing that I'm returning, the um, scan parameters that I support on the first page, the information I need with each subsequent page. But we want to have Dropshot take care of as much of the rest as possible to, uh, so that we can just test that in one place, make sure that it's right and make sure that the easiest thing is the thing that people, that, that's actually gonna work basically. And, and that's this is a place where you see lots of APIs kind of goofing up where rather than one means of paginating, you'll see three or four or five or six as different developers just do whatever they need in that spot. You have APIs like from Google where everything is said fast, consistent, and then places like Slack API where you see five or six different means of paginating over different things. Yeah, that's an important point. The consistency is a big part here because if someone just copies and paste, it would be the easiest thing to do would be to copy and paste the code from one endpoint to another and that will actually work generally and do the right thing here. So, um, so this is an example of a paginated endpoint in Dropshot and it looks pretty similar to the one that we already had, but uh, what's a little different here is the struct that we use for this for the query type parameter is this pagination params. And I realized at this point, if you haven't seen Rust before, this is probably starting to look like a mouthful. And it is kind of a mouthful, but 
trust me, you do get used to it and, and it ends up buying you quite a bit. So anyway, this pagination param struct says this is a paginated API and it, its query parameters are determined by that. And what parameters does it take? Well, it takes some set of parameters on that first page, which are the scan and filter parameters, and then some information it needs for all subsequent pages, which is going to be wrapped up by Dropshot. It's going to be serialized um, and then wrapped in Base64 just to emphasize that it's opaque and the college is not supposed to mess with it. Um, and then what you return is a results page. And a results page is also a type provided by Dropshot that makes sure that all the results pages across all the paginated collections look the same. Of course, they have different contents in the, in the, in the like, list of actual items. That's the pet in this case. So that's why you have this extra type parameter for pet. What does that look like when you go to open API, the open API spec? Again, we have the uh, actual endpoint function at the top left. We have the structure describing the scan parameters at the bottom left. In this case, we just take this one tags argument, which is a string. And what we have, uh, the pagination params struct from Dropshot provides a limit parameter that's gonna look the same and behave the same across all of our paginated endpoints. The page selector shows up in this page token. It's always a string because Dropshot takes care of serializing that. And then the scan parameters are used to provide whatever other things you have here. And you, you can have as many fields as you want here. Uh, in this case, we just have one tag string. And again, just to highlight the, the rust.comment for that tags to filter on is it or tags to filter for is what shows up in the open API spec for that parameter. One, th one thing to note about these open API spec is that each of these parameters are optional, unlike the ones before, because either a caller is going to say, here is my page token or they're gonna say, here are my tags, here are my initial parameters. So you've got two optional parameters. Yeah, that's a good point. And Dropshot also takes care of figuring out which case you're in. So we don't have the code here, but essentially you, you, you're either on the first page and you have the scan parameters available, or you're on a subsequent page and you have your page selector available. And Dropshot basically figures that out and gives you whichever one you have. And you can't get it wrong. It, it won't compile if you try to do the wrong thing. So that's pagination was kind of an example for us where we could build something a little bit higher level. It's not something we've actually even seen in most of the other Rust libraries that we looked at that gives some guardrails and some you know, a way to do something that's going to be relatively easy and hopefully do the, the scalable, consistent and correct thing for anyone who's using it. And so we've been using Dropshot at Oxide for the development of our public API as well as for uh, a bunch of internal APIs as well. And uh, you know, it's kind of the flow that we just described. We're starting with this textual description to get feedback on to better understand it. Then we're starting to prototype it and then that becomes the contract. And I think the expectation is that when that starts to stabilize, then the generated open API spec is something that we might decide to check in. And that way we can see very clearly all the changes that we're making and know when we're making incompatible changes. So what we built in Dropshot was the workflow that worked for us, uh, that we knew was going to be important for the way that we needed to build software and that our team worked. Um, and some of this to say this contract first versus code first, this is a false dichotomy. Um, we've all got the same principles that we want to apply to these software projects of consistency and expediency, um, of making the easy things easy and uh, you know, being able to collaborate well and delivering a good experience. So this is how we decided to, to fill that niche based on our team and our product. Um, and we also found that having a pro programmatic contract, one that's in code, uh, allowed us to be a, a lot more consistent uh, and communicate with our team in the way that we needed to communicate. So we'll be available for some Q&A if folks are sticking around. We may be wearing different shirts in just a second. Um, but if you'd like to learn more, you can check out um, information about the Oxide Computer Company. Um, Dropshot is available as a Rust library, so you can see the docs for that. Um, if you want to just learn more about Rust, our colleague Steve Klavnik has written a great book, which is a great place to start learning about Rust. Or you can hit us up at these links on Twitter. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.